Hello everyone, thank you for joining us and welcome to the Mic on Hour. We are a mining consultancy that has provided independent professional advice to mining companies, providers of capital, law firms, and government agencies for over 30 years. Staffed by senior industry consultants with extensive international experience, we are here to discuss relevant topics for the benefit of our mineral industry followers. And now, here is your host, MyCon's Mineral Resource Specialist, Alan San Martin. Hello, everyone. I am Alan San Martin. We are happy to have you here with us today. I'd like to begin with our sustainability statement. At MyCon, we work with our clients to promote responsible mining and to integrate the principles of sustainability into their mining projects. In today's episode, we will talk about valuation approaches for different types of mineral properties. We will discuss this topic and at the end, we will have about 10 minutes for questions from the audience joining us on Zoom. I'm here today with our co-host and colleague, Derek Debit. He's joining us from our Norwich office in the UK. Derek is a Principal Process Engineer, Senior Project Manager and Director of MyCon. Hello Derek, how are you today? Hi Alan, very well, thank you very much and uh, thanks for inviting me to give this talk. It's something that I really enjoy, mineral asset valuation, so thanks for the opportunity, I really appreciate it. Great, um, so if we can start the conversation, Derek, I will ask you what is meant by valuation of mineral assets? Alan, it's basically the valuation of a mineral asset is to determine the market value in monetary terms for which a property will transact between unrelated parties on a particular day. Now you would have heard that I used the word market value. Market value, that is the estimation amount for which this mineral property should exchange on the valuation date. And that is between a willing buyer and a willing seller. And what is very important is that this willing buyer and willing seller, they need to be unrelated. So we say they need to be at an arm's length transaction. And normally it requires some marketing that's being performed uh, between the buyer and the seller, and they must act knowledgeably, prudently, and without compensation. All right. Why is important to know the value of a mineral property? Knowing the value of a mineral asset is important for various stakeholders in the mining industry and the exploration industry, particularly for the areas of sales, mergers, acquisitions, investments, regulatory. Uh, to give just a, a few simple examples, uh, a mineral asset valuation might be required to support a fairness opinion, and in a fairness opinion is when there are related parties both buying and selling, and you want to protect the minority shareholders. Sometimes you want to test for impairment. Alan, that's when you've bought an asset, but for some reason, you, you the value of that asset is now decreasing, so you want to impair the value, the value on the balance sheet. Then there's sales and there's acquisition, there's price securities in initial public offering on exchanges, listing support, support for financial statements. Uh, sometimes, you know, you want to support your property agreement. Uh, there's litigations where you require it, expiration compensation. Uh, there's really such a lot of corporate valuation purposes like tax matters in insurance and so forth. For some of our listeners that are listed entity, to note is that for a listed company that require uh, a mineral asset valuation, that's normally guided by the securities regulations or the listing requirements. All right, so what are the standards for mineral asset valuation? Are they different for the different jurisdictions? In order to ensure transparency and, and materiality and competence, uh, 
Mineral asset valuations are conducted in accordance with some international valuation codes. The major international mineral asset valuation codes are Valman in Australia, that's been mainly used throughout Australasia. Then you get the SimVal code that's used in North America, a lot within Canada. Uh, the SamVal code, which is the Southern Africa code, and they are all three fairly similar. The guiding philosophy of the major mineral asset valuation codes is that mineral property valuations be performed in a standardized and system, um, systematic manner. This is normally done by an appropriately qualified individual, which is termed a competent valuator. And finally, that all relevant information be fully disclosed in evaluation report. The standard for mineral property valuation, that's guided by the International Mineral Valuation Committee, or INVAL in short, and they've generated standard templates. So what INVAL does, Alan, it harmonizes the applicable valuation codes and standards of the INVAL mineral, um, INVAL member countries. Well, what they also do is generally follow some international valuation standards published by the International Valuation Standards Council. INVAL was, was formed to develop an international standard for mineral property valuation. It is intended as a common set of minimum standards concerning valuation of uh, mineral assets. And then, uh, Alan, just finally, I want to say that, you know, INVAL represents a consensus of current good practices, and it contains some outlines on what is the requirements, what is the guidance, and the definitions. Yeah, so the projects are at different levels. Everyone is different. So at what level of, of the project development stage a mineral asset valuation is required? Good. And you've been in the mining industry for quite a while, so you will know that Mineral properties cover quite a broad spectrum. And the one extreme lie those properties which are already in production. They yeah. have got their operating histories. They, uh, they've got a reasonable estimation of future operational and economic parameters. But then on the other side, there might be properties that can be considered to be geolo geologically attractive, but on which very little to sometimes even no exploration has been done. And then in between, you've got really the majority of the properties. So the applicability of the valuation method, that depends on the stage of development. Although to a certain degree, there is some overlap between the, the different stages. In Bell, that together with the three major international mineral asset valuation codes, they propose valuation of mineral assets by applying three different valuation methods. And this depends on the assets development stage and the availability of certain information. Some methods are more sustainable for valuations than others. So these three methods, they are the cost approach, which is based on the principle of contribution. I'll, I'll explain that just now. I just want to go through them. The next one is the market approach. That's based on the principle of substitution. And then you get the income approach that is based on a discount cash flow model. For those of our listeners that's not so familiar, let me explain what is the cost approach. If you want to know, using the cost approach, what is the value of your house? You will go to an estimator and they will look at the value of the land. They will look at the value of how many bricks you require, how many cement you require, the amount of tiles required, the plumbing, electricity, and they will add all of that up and then they will get a cost approach valuation of a house. Very similar within mineral assets, you look at the historical expenditure and the future projected 
expenditure. Now, this has got to be value adding expenditure. You can't just spend money for the sake of spending money. And then what the valuator will do is they will multiply that amount with some other prospectivity enhancement multiplier depending on the stage of the project. The next one, the next one is the market approach. So in the, in the instance of your house, what the market approach is doing, it says, what is the value that my neighbor very recently received for his or her house when that came into the market? And it will value your property depending on a recent similar um, a project or property in my example's case. So for a mineral asset valuation, it will look at a similar mineral asset and it will determine the value based on a comparative transaction and then the income approach that's where you've used a discount cash flow model for people not so familiar with the discount cash flow model the, the best example is to go into something like a hotel where there's initially a capital outlay and then there is income and there is maintenance expenditure what the right. discount get, uh, cash flow method does it is bring all these different values to a common date and it then determines what is that amount so the discount cash flow ca uh, discount cash flow method is a valuation method that estimate the value of an investment based on expected future cash flows, that's your income and your expenditure, and it and analyzes and it determines the value of the investment today based on these projected and future cash, cash flows. So I've also, okay. you've got there on the screen a graphical representation of what is called the value curve. That's how you enhance the value of your property. It's a discovery, um, it's fairly low. It then increased to preliminary economic uh, assessments. It then further increased more to your project feasibility study, then your feasibility study and your commissioning. And as you can see on this slide, you've got the cost approach that you use for discovery and the preliminary economic assessment, but you yeah. can also use the market approach. And then as you get into your pre-feasibility study, you then start using your income approach because you've then converted your resources into reserves. What's quite interesting to note is that the market approach can be used all the way from discovery going into production. So for people more familiar with projects, you can see that the cost is, uh, approach is your exploration target and maybe inferred resources. As you get into indicated, proven and probable, is start using your income approach. Yeah, so we have clients coming to us uh, or they want to do a deal or a business on a mineral property. So what is the earliest you can perform evaluation in a mineral asset? It's a question that I get quite a lot. Um, yeah. We've got to understand that the driver of a mineral asset is primarily based on the mineral resource size the grade, the revenue that you can generate from it, and the cost associated with developing it. Um, and thus for the majority, Alan, the size of the mineral asset, that's very much dependent on a code compliant resource and reserve. This is not really strictly true. You, there is valuation methods out there that you can use before you've got a resource in and, and reserve. The problem with them is they can be fairly subjective. Um, so I normally advise clients to have some code compliant resource such that we can value it on that basis. Remember, the value of a mineral asset is dependent on the level of development, the location, the political risk, and the modifying factors to convert your resource into a reserve. And that's why normally when you've developed 
a code compliant resource or a reserve, you've got a lot better understanding of your mineral asset and the risk associated to that. And that makes for a much more exact uh, valuation. Yeah, so there, there has been a lot of discussions about using the comparable transaction curve to value mineral assets. Can you briefly explain why this method is considered a simplified approach? Yeah, so Alan, remember I spoke about the market valuation approach? Yeah. The comparable transaction curve is a graphical representation of the market valuation approach. Under the market approach, data from actual sales transactions of comparable, and that's very important, mineral assets are used to determine a reasonable value. Uh, this method is very favorable since it, it's straightforward, simple calculations, and makes use of real transactions that are actual. So it is also independent of all the subjective forecasts and has the, the, the nice thing about the market using the market valuation approach as i've shown previously it's got the widest application within the three major valuation codes uh, allowing for valuation of exploration development and production properties so as you can see that the graph that you're presenting there we've got on the x-axis the mineral resources and the mineral reserves. And they increase on the x-axis from inferred to indicated, to measured, to probable and proven. And what we've got on the y-axis is we've got the unit value and it's a logarithmic scale. So you'll see it starts off at clearly a low value of 0.1, going up to 1, 10, 100. So if you have a specific property and you yeah. know that that property is all the way at measure, you can now position that within the x-axis. And you now have got a value range that you mm -hmm. can read from the y-axis. And in this particular one, it will range anything from about 20 to 100. And that is 20 to 100, in this particular instance, dollars per ounce. And now you know your property is worth between 20 and, uh, let's call it, um, 100 US dollars per ounce. You will now multiply your amount of ounces in your measured category, and that will give you a total value for your property. And that's why it's such a basic method to use at the end of the day, all that you require is a mineral resource and then a graphic, a graph like this, which we, which we produce and update regularly. And then you can position your property onto the, the graph and determine its value. So sometimes I, I, I have this experience. So why do companies, uh, they buy high, and they say low. Is this because of an uh, incorrect valuation? Yeah, that, that does happen, Alan. Um, the, the problem is that a, a key driver is really your commodity price and your risk. Price is directly proportional to your commodity price. Whatever you're going to buy or sell your property for, it's very, it's very much linked to the commodity price, but it's inversely proportional to risk, meaning that the higher the risk, the lower is the value. Thus, mm -hmm. if the commodity price is overestimated or the risk is underestimated, this might lead to incorrect high value. So it's quite important to determine very early in the project, what are the risks? And when you buy your property, that you should understand the underlying risk. And that's normally where your due diligence come in, to understand the geological risk, to understand the mining risk, the process, metallurgy risk, very important, the environmental and the social risk. 
such a big component to determine underlying the value of your property. So at the end of the day, Alan, when you see a company has bought for a very high, they are over optimistic, which normally can mean they're over optimistic with regards to uh, uh, recoveries, over optimistic with regards to commodity prices, uh, over optimistic with regards to schedule, and they've got probably sometimes also they underestimate the complexity or the challenges associated with the ore body, the mining, the environmental side, uh, or, or any of those challenges. Or they are buying a property where insufficient work with regards to consultation uh, or test work has been done. Right. So here at Micron, we are considered the experts and we help our clients to get their valuations. What do we bring to the table? Alan Chris Letanzi, founding uh, president of Micon and a director till 2018. He was a member of Simval Committee. Uh, they were mandated by the Canadian Institute of Mining, Metallurgy and Petroleum to develop standards and guidelines for the valuation of mineral properties. Micon has got recognized expertise in mineral property valuation that we gained through consulting assignments and all the major base and pressures, metals, energy, minerals, and a wide range of industrial metal, uh, minerals at, at different stages of development. Micon has got competent valuators, mm -hmm. and we've, we've uh, applied our expertise in listing companies and doing valuations for exchanges in Canada, Australia, London, Europe, and Hong Kong. So our competent valuators, they've got a very broad commodity and project development experience. Right. So having said that, uh, how does the mineral asset valuation complements Micron Services portfolio? Very well. You, you, Alan, we provide services in exploration, PEA, PFS, feasibility study, you know, whether it's exploration advice, whether it's mineral resource and est uh, estimation, process development, but also with regards to construction and production, we, we operate in those areas through analytical testing and pilot plants and also product specification, market intelligence, technical support. The nice thing about mineral asset valuations is they start can start at expiration. You can do a mineral asset valuation in a preliminary economic assessment. It's very important to convert your resources and reserves that you understand the, the ultimate value as well as your feasibility study and throughout the production phases. So mineral asset valuations follows all the different stages in which Micron operates. Yeah, so to start uh, wrapping up this conversation, what are your final comments? Alan, I've been doing mineral asset valuations for quite a long time. I can say that the evaluation of a mineral asset is a very important part of developing and extracting natural resources. It is the driver why investors risk capital. As such, it's quite important that it should be performed in a systematic and a transparent manner by a qualified person that will consider all the technical, all the economical, all the regulatory factors. The valuation should be, should be performed in accordance with uh, International Mineral Asset Valuation Code to ensure that the estimated market value, that it's an uh, accurate reflection in monetary terms or for which the property will transact. And the valuation should be a range rather than an absolute value and it's very important that it should be time and circumstances specific. And for that, you've got a valuation date. Yeah. Okay. So I think that right now we're going to open the microphone to our audience so you can ask your questions. Uh, I'm going to now enable. Please, if you have a question, you can raise your hand or just go ahead and talk.
Okay, I will give you an, another few seconds. Don't be shy, you can talk. I actually have a question. Please go ahead. Yeah. That was a great discussion, guys. Very informative. Um, you mentioned that there are three regulatory codes, um, and you said they are all very similar. Uh, but what are the differences between these codes? Like, what are, what are they? Yeah, look, fortunately, they're, they're very, very small differences. Um, if I recall correctly, the application of whether you have to use one valuation method is only required by Simvel. Simvel, Simvel uh, has got no requirement that you have to do two valuation methods, whereas Valman and Simvel require you to use two methods, two valuation methods, and then you need to substantiate and you need to justify why the one value is preferred above the other one. So that's the difference. Simvel uh, doesn't state two requirements, Valman and Samvel does. Simvel, uh, they've got a primary and a secondary valuation approach, depending on the stage of development. Whereas Valman and Samvel, they provide more general guidance it's up to the evaluator, but there is a table providing guidance to the evaluator what should be used. In the case of Simwell, they fairly prescriptive and tell you what is the primary valuation method you should use and the secondary one. Then there's some small differences in what valuation method they prescribed and how how, how, how they actually provide you with that guidance. And then also in the valuation reporting, all three have got different requirements on the certain statements that you have verbatim they have to state. They, they differ in the three different codes, but they also the contents, the table of contents are slightly different between the, the two. But to just give you a good uh, and just to, to sum it up, these changes, these differences is so small that if you would have done a valuation in accordance with Velman, for instance, it shouldn't take more than a day or two to convert that to Samvel, or it shouldn't take a day or two more than to convert them to um, uh, Samvel. They are very, very small. And generally, the underlying work to come up with a value range in all three of these codes are, are very similar, if not e exact. Okay, so thank you. Um, we have a, a question that someone put in the chat. It's from Clyde Macmillan. I'm going to read it now. So he's wondering what is uh, in the dollars per ounce equation? He said, what is considered inside that, that number? So basically, if, if you know about a company that has sold their, and let's make it easy, their gold project um, for $10 million, what you need to, to, such that you can put a dot on the curve, you need to know two things, uh, basically three things. You need to know it's $10 million, so that's the one thing. The second thing is, you need to know what was the classification of all the resources and reserves. If it was 100% only inferred, then it's easy because that dictates the x-axis immediately. If there is a combination, like in most properties, between inferred, indicated, and measured, you'll do a small, very basic calculation to now determine and weigh the inferred to the indicated to the measured and determine now the x-axis. After you've done that calculation, you're now at, let's call it um, 2.7, where 2.7 is a good indication that it is not at the incurred, it's more at the inferred, more at the indicated, close to the measured category. So now you've got that on the x-axis. Now remember, you've got the 10 million, and that 10 million, you now divide that through your amount 
of ounces because it's US dollars per ounce. So the 10 million is divided through the total amount of ounces and that might give you a value like one and then you've got the dot. You've got the dot of the one and you've got the dot of whether it's inferred, indicated or measured or a combination of that between the X and the Ys you now can place. And you go through all the different transactions and thus you now start generating this curve that's got quite low and then going up towards your probable and your proven. Okay, so for our audience, I encourage you to go ahead and speak. However, I see another written question that I will read now. This comes from Uma. I don't know your full name, but Uma is a good name. Um, he says, are Monte Carlo simulations widely used in, in constraining these projects? It is very popular. How many variables are typically modeled? Yes, Monte Carlo is used quite a lot. Remember, I said we want to value a range. Monte Carlo provides you with such a range. I like to use Monte Carlo for capital costs, so do a sensitivity on capital costs. Also like to do a Monte Carlo on sensitivity on operating cost. Revenue is a very important one to understand the sensitivity with regards to revenue. Anything linked to commodity prices, um, that's, that's normally very good to put into your, your Monte Carlo uh, simulation. And then discount rate as well. So generally speaking, if you start doing a Monte Carlo at least on capital cost, operating cost, and revenue, you can now start determining what is the project's sensitivity to changes there. And now you can start determining the value range, and you will then give the project a value depending on that value range. You can also add more factors to that. Uh, certain of the projects is very great. You can use grade if you want to, but remember grade comes back to revenue again. Mm -hmm. if every other uh, input that you want to use for the M Monte Carlo is normally classified either into operating, capital, or revenue, and that, that's normally the good three to start with. Okay. Um, so if someone has a question, we will take one more question. Otherwise, we will conclude this episode. Um, hey. Hi, guys. I've got a question. Can you hear me? Yes. Ben, pri ben, ben yes. please go ahead. Um, so just uh, on the valuation approaches, looking at the income approach and, and you're kind of initiating um, you know, that at the pre-feasibility stage, do you often um, start the income approach at sort of the PEA phase or even sometimes before that, um, you know, often analysts kind of want to get ahead of the, the curve and, and put together a DCF just based on a, you know, on a inferred resource or sometimes, you know, a portion of inferred and indicated um, to basically put some numbers um, to the paper uh, yeah. prior to that feasibility stage. <clears throat> Yeah, and, and what you're saying is 100% is correct. Very, very good question. There tends to be a requirement to do the income approach quite early. Um, I, I don't have a problem with that if you've got good input parameters. Um, so what are these, these input uh, uh, parameters? If you have a good understanding of the geology and you can do some indication from a mining schedule perspective, then you start knowing how these, um, again, let's take gold, the ounces, how these ounces will come out of the ground into the process plant. If you now have got some understanding of recovery you can now start building the recovery out of that and you can get your revenue. Again, with regards to operating cost and capital cost, the more of these inputs that you know, the better your discount cash flow model will be. What I have seen 
is that companies don't actually have that. They don't have an understanding of the mining side of things. And then it really becomes almost rubbish in, rubbish out, because then you just start building an Excel model. And that Excel model is going to be fairly, it's got a high possibility to be inaccurate. But if you have a good understanding of the drivers going into the discount cash flow model, and they're not that difficult and they're not that complex, you should just apply a little bit of, of knowledge and expertise and so forth, you can do that. I would caution to do a discount cash flow model prior to a PEA, just mainly because you just don't have enough um, information to build a proper discount cash flow model. What is the life of mine is a critical question. Uh, yes, 20 years, 30 years is not going to be a significant change in your overall NPV. But at the end of the day, there is quite a big difference between 10 years and, and 20 years. So do you really know how big your resource is? If you do, that's great. You know, then, then, then you, you, you've got more information. Um, again, as I've said, re recoveries, it's quite important to make, is there various lithologies and will the recoveries be the same? And how confident am I on with regards to that? similar the driver on the operating cost. So again, you can see where I'm going. I'm going with, if you've got a good understanding, discount cash flow model is great. But if you don't have a good understanding, it's not that accurate. What I can say is that I also think that most people like to use the discount cash flow model because to a certain degree, it does overvalue the project. Um, and the reason why it overvalues the pro uh, property is because of something called the discount rate. And if your discount rate is not proper and not correct, if you're not being open and honest and saying, what do I know and what is my risk? If you're gonna use all these uncertainties and you're gonna use a discount rate of 8%, your NPV is gonna be very, very, very high. And that is not a correct representation of the overall value. A property at, at such level of not understanding it should probably be valued at 15%. And that's where you start getting in the discrepancy between what, what the NPV is giving you and sometimes companies um, a market cap. If you just go and have a look what companies sometimes publish and the market cap, there's a big discrepancy between the two. And, and it boils down to you know, the, the not really, the market doesn't really believe that, but sometimes it's just the risk factors. Okay. So thank you very for co-hosting this episode with us and to all our audience. Thank you very much for being here with us today. And we will be ending this show now. Thank you so much. And I'll see you next time. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Please feel free to leave your comments or questions and be sure to follow us on LinkedIn and subscribe to our newsletter so you're kept informed on future episodes.